I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't take time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. So I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I just had to take time to pray. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you, O Lord, for the blessing of another day of life upon the earth. I pray, O Lord, that the lesson glorify you and edify your saints. Please help me, Father, to teach it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please turn to John chapter 14. John 14. We're going to discuss a familiar passage. It's familiar to the folks here in our church and seems that no matter how many times I preach publicly, there's always a measure of nervousness. They say that's a good thing. Yeah. I pulled in this morning and I didn't see the preacher's vehicle over by where it normally is. And I thought to myself, ah, God. Preacher's, <laughs> preacher's, preacher's not here. Okay, that's, that's good. And then I'm over here talking to, to uh, Brother Yoder and I see out of the corner of my eye there's Brother James. I'm like, Oh, no, he's here, he's here. <laughs> Better be on my best behavior. All right. John chapter 14, the, the setting in John chapter 14 um, is the, the last supper before the Lord's crucifixion, the last meal he's enjoying with his disciples, his friends, his brethren, just before he goes to the cross to pay for the sins of all mankind. And let's just read John 14. Our, our verses today will be John 14, 1 through 14. John 14, 1 through 14. So beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If he had known me, he should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
Now, let's look at verse 1. The setting goes back to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, the Lord makes certain dark, foreboding statements. For example, in John 13, 18, he says, He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. In 13, 21, the Lord says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. In 13, 33, the Lord says, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And in verse 36, he says, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. And in verse 38, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And on the heels of these dark sayings, the Lord says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now, John chapters 14, 15, and 16 involve a long discourse between Jesus and his disciples. In chapters 14 through 16, the Father, referring to the Heavenly Father, is mentioned some 45 times. Just in chapter 14 alone, the Father is mentioned 23 times. In those three chapters, 14 through 16, the word love in its various forms, love, loveth, loved, is mentioned 22 times. And so it begs the question, how does that ha help us to understand verse number one? Well, it tells us that the Father loves us. The Father loves you. And when we have those issues in our life, such as, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Have you ever had somebody do something against you? Probably have. Remember that the Father loves you. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Have you ever suffered betrayal by somebody close to you? Remember that the Father loves you. <clears throat> Whither I go, ye cannot come. Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. We're here on the earth. Jesus is up in heaven at the right hand of the Father. We can't be with him now, but we want to be with him now. That's okay. The Father loves you. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Have you denied the Lord through some sin, through some personal sin? Remember that the Father loves you. John 14, 1 is also a deity verse. It says, and the whole chapter really is, is a deity verse. All of the gospel according to John uh, portrays Jesus as, as God. And so verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I couldn't say that and get away with it. If I went up to you and I said, Brother Jake, you believe in God? Okay. Believe also in me. Brother Jake's going to have a hard time with that. Jesus could say that and get away with it. Amen. Because Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. As it tells us, we all know 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's a big statement. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Jesus could say, you believe in God, believe also in me. I couldn't say that, but he can. And then in verse 2, the Lord states, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I would have told you. See, Jesus isn't going to waste your time. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I find that very comforting. Amen. A mansion. Mansions, it's a, it's a habitation, big house. When we think of those mansions in England and Scotland that we see pictures of, um, they're like 20 rooms with servants, and they're enormous. The Father's house has many mansions. Think for a moment. One house, many large houses within that house. And an interesting note is that uh, there are some of the new versions, like the RSV is one of them, I looked at that this morning, where they change mansions to rooms. 
in my father's house are many rooms, that tends to diminish the greatness of the father's house. And I have to wonder if maybe that was their purpose, the, New Test the, uh, uh, the modern version editors. And then he says again in verse 2, I go to prepare a place for you. If you would please turn to Revelation 20. I go to prepare a place for you. I like the sound of that. Amen. And in Revelation 20, uh, 20, verse 11, the Holy Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I go to prepare a place for you, but there's found no place for them. Why not? They're fleeing from the face of him that's sitting on the throne. Why? Because they died in their sins. They didn't die in faith. And there's found no place for them. That Revelation 20.11 just brings verse 2 that much more comfort to my heart. And then, um, in verse 2, we also see where the Lord says, I go to prepare a place for you. Not, there is a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is one of many verses which debunks Calvinism and their definition of predestination and election. I go to prepare a place for you. If Calvinism were true, the Lord would have already having supposedly predestinated X number of people to be saved. He would have already prepared X number of places in the Father's house, but he did not. He goes to prepare a place for you. And then in verse 3, let's look at verse 3. It says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's our the blessed hope. Blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's an allusion to, I will come again. These are, these are verses of great comfort. Amen. These are what you would call assurance verses. I will come again. That's a declarative statement. Not I might come again or I may come again. I will Amen. come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there's another part of the deity of Jesus. He says that where I am, not where I will be, where I am, he's on earth with his disciples, yet where I am, he's in the Father, and the Father is in him. So while he's here in his humanity, he's with the Father in heaven at the same time. That shows the deity of Jesus. And then in verse 4, the Lord says, And whither I go ye know... And the way ye know, and Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, you know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. And Thomas says, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? All right, Thomas, we've fellowshiped for three and a half years. We've eaten together, we've traveled together, we've ministered together, you've seen my miracles, we sailed on the same boats together, and, uh, you know, Thomas isn't getting it. Three and a half years. Thomas, do you not remember when I said in John 7, 35, yet a little while while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me? Thomas, do you remember in John 16, 16, that I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father, you know where I'm going. Thomas, do you not remember in John 16, 18, when I said, I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world again? Again, <clears throat> again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Thomas, I told you where I'm going, and I told you how to get there. And Thomas isn't grasping it. And it's like us sometimes. We sit under the preaching and teaching of our pastors and our deacons and our Bible teachers week after week, month after month, and they preach and preach and preach and preach and preach and preach, and we'll still have that 
same sin, that same vice, that same bad attitude, those same thoughts, that same language, how come I'm not getting it? How come we're not grasping it? And it must be a source of great frustration to a lot of pastors because they preach their hearts out. They've invested their lives in preaching the word of God to their congregations only to see some in their congregation repeat the same mistakes over and over again. You know, Thomas didn't have the technology that we have, the cell phones and all that, to distract him. We have those things to distract us from the word of God, from prayer, from study of the Holy Bible. But, but the one thing Thomas did have that we have in common with him is the flesh. And do we not think about our problems and think about our problems and worry about our burdens? And, and we have those things within us that distract us. And we just need to get our focus back in the Word of God and not let our minds drift when, when the pastors are teaching us the Word of God. Then in verse 5, Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, this very well-known verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thomas, not only do you know that I'm going to the Father, but you also know that I am the way to the Father in heaven. Now, that's a passage that we use to show the unsaved world there's no other way to the Father. There might be many ways to Jesus, through a personal witness, through a gospel tract, through a church service, but there's only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. So I'm going to lay out a list of things which are obvious to everybody here, pretty much. And, but I'm going to say them openly for the sake of maybe somebody uh, at some future time who might uh, see this, and, and it just needs to be said obviously and, and openly. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Your religion, your pope, your priest, your rabbi, your imam, your minister, your mother Mary, uh, your baby baptism in water, your adult baptism in water, that's not the way to the Father. Your sacraments, the Ten Commandments, your good works, your good deeds, your Sabbath keeping, quote unquote, that's not the way to the Father. Your perfect attendance at the church house, your perfect attendance at the synagogue, the mosque, the temple, that's not the way to the Father. Your donations of money, time, and labor, that's not the way to the Father. The sincerity of your particular belief system is not the way to the Father. Your love for your family is not the way to the Father. Faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to the Father. I've just stated the obvious. I've just preached to the choir. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord till kingdom come. All right. So I want to address something in John 14, 6 that's not so obvious. And I need to preface my statements by saying I'm not rebuking. I'm not criticizing. I want to say this as gently as I possibly can. And, and we'll see as we go. Let's look at John 14, 6 again. I'm going to read to you the evangelical version. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto heaven but by me. That's not what it says, is it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read to you the evangelical version. In verse 18, we'll begin in verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to heaven by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of getting people into heaven. Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto heaven, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of getting people into heaven. Verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to heaven. Brethren, that's not what it says. The Holy Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, 
not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I am not reconciled to a place. I am reconciled to a person. I am reconciled to the Father in heaven. If you flip back, keep your finger in, I should have said keep your finger in John 14. But let's just flip back to John 14. And we'll look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto heaven that where heaven is, there ye may be also. That was the evangelical version. No, it says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Please turn to 1 Timothy 2.5. Keep your finger in, in uh, John 14, please. 1 Timothy 2.5, you know it well. The evangelical version says, for there is one God and one mediator between heaven and men, the man Christ Jesus. The biblical version says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So, so what do we have here? We have a mediator. We have Jesus Christ. He's in the bosom of the Father. He's on the right hand of the Father. And over here he's got me. And he stands as that daysman that Job spoke of between the Father and me. I'm reconciled to the Father because my sins offended the Father. My sins did not offend a place. My sins did not offend a part of the creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I'm not reconciled to a place. I'm reconciled to a person. I'm re reconciled to the person of God the Father. Amen. Two more, very quickly. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. The evangelical version will tell you, Come unto heaven, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and heaven will give you rest. No. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Last one, John 12. Last one, John 12. In verse 32. And I, John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto heaven. No. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, and he was, will draw all men unto me. The object of our salvation is not a place. It's not a destination. It's not a physical place. It's not a spiritual place. The object of our salvation is the person of God himself. And I'm reminded, I don't remember if it's Genesis 12 or Genesis 15, where God say, said to Abraham, fear not Abraham, I am thy exceeding great reward. The object of, of our salvation, what we have been, we've been delivered from our sins and we've been delivered to not some place but someone. Amen. And that someone is God the Father in heaven. I don't offer lost men heaven. I don't ask them, do you want to go to heaven when you die? Because, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm saying this as gently as I can. When you ask somebody, do you want to go to heaven when you die, the natural tendency is, oh, heaven, oh, when I die, oh, that's when I'm 80 or 90 years old and I die quietly in my sleep in a nursing home somewhere and I go to a better place. That's most people's idea of when I die. And the problem with that approach is that it, it does not bring about any, it does not inculcate any urgency to get saved in the present moment. And just using my own, my own salvation experience as, a, as an example, I didn't get saved because I wanted to go to heaven. Hell was always in the background. I knew it was there. And hell, we need to preach on hell. But, but what drove me to get saved 
was when the realization came to me where the Bible says your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God that he will not hear. Your sins and iniquities have separated between you and your God that he will not hear. And that so bothered me, that so troubled me, because all my life I thought my Catholic religion had me okay with God. Now I find in the, in the Holy Bible, reading it for the first time in my life some 31 years ago, I'm separated from God. And so I went to the Lord. And I didn't pray a sinner's prayer, and I didn't invite Jesus into my filthy life. I said, Lord, I'm not trusting, I'll tell you what I said to him, I'm not trusting anything or anybody except your son and the blood he shed on the cross to deliver me from my sins. That was my quote-unquote sinner's prayer, not your typical type of sinner's prayer. But on that day, I got saved, and the Holy Spirit indwelt me, and he's been teaching me through, through my entire Christian life how to walk in in the right way. You know, when, when I, I used to offer men heaven, that's, that's what they wanted in Genesis 11. They didn't build a tower to God. They, they built a tower to reach unto heaven. I offer lost men Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen from the dead. I'm not reconciled to a place. I'm reconciled to a person, the person of the Father. Jesus didn't mediate between heaven and men. Jesus mediated between the person of God and the persons of men. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 7. Please. If he had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen... Look, let's just stop right there. And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? This is Thomas part two. Philip doesn't get it either. Philip, we've traveled for three and a half years. We've eaten together for three and a half years. We've ministered together for three and a half years. And you you don't know me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest then, show us the Father? In the, in the time that they had with Jesus in his humanity here on the earth, Jesus' disciples saw the Father in Jesus in the same way that the world expects to see Jesus in us. The disciples saw the Father in Jesus' words. John seven forty six. Never man spake like this man. Do our words put the Father on display before the world? The disciples saw the Father in Jesus' character. Hebrews 7.26, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Does our character put the holiness of the Father on display before the world? The disciples saw the Father in Jesus' works. John 5.36, this is Jesus speaking. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Do our works bear witness that the sinless Son of God has sent us into the world? The disciples saw the Father in Jesus' love. John 13, 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Do we love others in a way that puts Jesus on display before the world? The disciples saw the Father in Jesus' compassion, Mark 6, 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved. He was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Does our compassion extend to lost souls to teach them about the good shepherd, that they would recognize Jesus in us? Throughout his entire ministry, the disciples saw the Father in Jesus in a multitude of different ways. Does the world see the Father in us? Does the world see the Son of God in us? Verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words, watch this now, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the 
works. Words, works. The words of the Son are the works of the Father. Because the words of the Father work in the heart of the lost man to convict him of his sin. And the words of the Father work in the heart of the Christian to convict the, the Christian of his need to walk in holiness. Just as the, the words of the Father working in the heart of a lost man work to convict the lost man of his need to become saved. The words of Jesus are the works of the Father. John 14, 11. Believe me. That's a commandment. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Fellas, if you won't take my word for it, at least look at the things I've done. I've made blind men see, deaf men hear, lame men walk, I've cleansed lepers, I've raised the dead. If you, the Jews require a sign, I've given you many signs. If you're not going to take me at my word, at least look at the things I've done and believe me for the work's sake. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Now that statement in verse 12 is within the context of verse 11. The words are the works. And so here you have Jesus, here you have Jesus uh, in his humanity as one man in one place at one time 2,000 years ago. And yes, there were times when he could preach to multitudes, but he says, when he says, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Why is that key? Because he had to go to his Father to send the Comforter to indwell the believer, and now the believer, now the man, now the woman can be trusted to carry the gospel to the whole world, and we're not just one person in one place at a time. We are many members of one body, and we go out into our neighbors, into foreign lands, into other states, into other streets, preaching the gospel, doing what Jesus cannot do now, because his ministry is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. Our ministry is to do what he said and take the word, the gospel, out to everybody else, something he cannot do right now. Verses 13 and 14, the last two verses in the passage. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So here the Lord sets forth two conditions for God to answer our prayers in the affirmative. Um, it presumes that we are going to pray whatsoever ye shall ask. It presumes that we are going to pray. That will I do. There's an assurance. He says, I will do it. Two conditions. Number one, we pray in the name of Jesus. And really, the only ones who are going to pray in the name of Jesus are those who are born again through faith in Jesus. And number two, is what we're asking for going to glorify the Father? If we're praying in the name of Jesus and what we're, our particular petition is something that will glorify the Father, he'll say yes. He said, I will do it. If it's just, just something that we're going to consume upon our lusts, don't expect, it to, don't expect him to say yes. One last large point. We do have a few minutes remaining. Okay. The, the concept here, the idea, the reality... Let's go back to John 14, 6. John 14, 6 is something that could be, is a verse that could be exposited for days. And the thing that I found fascinating here in connection with 1 Timothy 3, 16 is where the Holy Bible says God was manifested in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. And I started thinking to myself, if God was manifest in the flesh, what else was manifested in the flesh? What about God was manifested in the flesh? What characteristics of God, what, what attributes of God, what aspects of God were also manifested in the flesh? And 
Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the way to the Father, and that way was manifested in a body of flesh, in a simple body of flesh. Jesus is the truth manifested in a body of flesh. Jesus is the life manifested in a body of flesh. It's so easy to say the words, but we, you need to meditate on this. Truth. How many times have you spoken to one of these university students, what is truth? That's what Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, there it was in front of him, manifested in the flesh. Please turn to John 1. 1 John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. We're almost done. We're in the home stretch. John, 1 John 1 1. That which was from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it. It does not merely say life was manifested, it said the life. This person, this second person in the Godhead, he is the origin of all life. Amen. And there he is, standing there on two legs, and we have seen it, they said. We have seen it. How unique and how what a blessing it must have been to have been a Jew living in Israel during their visitation by God manifest in the flesh. We believe in a Jesus we haven't seen. We, we believe in him by faith. We haven't seen him, not yet. But we have the testimony of the 2,000-year-old testimony of people who were there. The life was manifested, and we have seen it. Verse 2, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He's not just life, he's eternal life. How was it? I believe it was Moses who stated in, in, in Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. That's what they saw. Think about it. That's what they saw. The everlasting to the everlasting, that's what was standing in front of them, manifest in the body of flesh. I find that fascinating. John 14, 9. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus is the Father. The Father himself manifested in a body of flesh. Please turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Three short minutes remaining. 1 Corinthians 1.24, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus is the power of God manifested in a body of flesh. Jesus is the wisdom of God manifested in the body of... When was the last time you saw wisdom in, phys in physical form? And yet they saw wisdom in physical form. They touched him, they handled him, they embraced him. Turn to John 1, Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ is the very Word of God. That which comes forth from the mouth of the Father, they saw it standing in front of them. It, it's, it's a difficult thing for me to wrap my mind around, but all of these attributes and aspects and, and, and characteristics of God were manifest in a single person in the flesh, and they saw it. We have yet to see it. If you would please turn to Luke chapter 2. I'm going to try not to have you turn too much. I will read through these. But Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 25, I would like you to see. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, Luke 2, 25, whose name was Simeon. And the man, the same man, was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, circumcision, eight days old, then took he, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou servant 
Let us now thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Here's Simeon, he has this baby in his hands, and this child of flesh, this is salvation, this is God's salvation, it's in front of him, it's in his hands. Manifested in a little body of flesh. Verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all thy people, of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Jesus is the light of the Gentiles, manifested in the flesh. Jesus is the glory of God's people Israel, manifested in a body of flesh. We are running out of time. I... I had some 19 or 20 different places to go. We'll just look at one more for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Ooh, one minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, made unto us, made unto us, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is our wisdom, manifested in the flesh. Jesus is our righteousness manifested in the flesh. Jesus is our sanctification and our redemption manifested in the flesh. And the list goes on and on and on. So if you want to see the way to the Father in the flesh, if you want to see the truth, the life in the flesh, if you want to see eternal life, if you want to see the Father himself, if you want to see the power of God, the wisdom of God, the word of God, the salvation of God manifested in a body of flesh, if you want to see the light of the Gentiles, the glory of Israel, the almighty God, if you want to see Messiah, if you want to see your wisdom, your righteousness, your sanctification, your redemption, the love of God, the grace of God, the Son of God manifested in a body of flesh, you don't have to look any farther than to look at Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is all of these things and many, many more, which time does not allow me to, to, to expand upon, manifested in one single individual body of flesh. Amen. And we will see him. Amen. And when we see him, he'll have that resurrected body because that body of flesh went to the cross. It died on the cross, but Jesus rose from the dead, and we will see him one day. Our blessed Father, we thank you, O Lord, in the name of Jesus, for the time that you allowed us to study your word this morning. I pray that you were glorified and the church was edified. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.